Okay. Hi, I'm Ruth Rosenberg. I'm the Director of Arts Education and Artist Engagement for the Mondavi Center. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity today to talk with musician, composer, and instrument builder Paul Drescher about the Mondavi Center's upcoming performance of uh, by Drescher Davel invented instrument duo, and also talk with two UC Davis professors, uh, Shirley Chang and Henry Spiller, about their physics and music course, which is one of our Mellon Foundation funded uh, SHAPE courses. So I'm going to start with Paul. Paul, you and your work is likely familiar to much of our audience, as you've performed in the Mondavi Center several times in the past. Uh, but for those who haven't yet seen you, perform? Can you talk about your career and especially how you became interested in building your own instruments and how you connected with your colleague, Joel, uh, Joel Davel, who will be performing with you? Well, I, I, I had a pretty conventional music uh, upbringing from an American middle class white family. I took piano lessons starting when I was around seven years old and didn't really connect that much to it, but I was always trying to write my own songs, which was, I suppose, uh, unusual and I also enjoyed when my teach, piano teacher taught me music theory. Theory was kind of an interesting puzzle and I think those were sort of indications that I had the kind of some of the inclinations that at least a lot of composers share. Uh, make your own make up your own thing and understand the system that governs or that governs the organization of sound. Uh, when I was allowed to top take, stop taking piano lessons when I was around 13 I instantly took up the guitar and became passionate about uh, the guitar and the pop music that was happening then in the mid 1960s. And, uh, but also was very aware because I'd always been going to uh, contemporary classical music concerts of the compositional world. I knew who John Cage was. I knew a lot of the thrusts of contemporary music because my father took me to performances of that at, at UCLA where he sometimes mm -hmm. taught. So I was always aware that there was a, a big world of composition I saw Stravinsky conduct at the Rose Bowl at the at the, at the uh, Hollywood Bowl uh, when I was uh, a, you know probably about ten years old something like that, and uh, so my transform from playing pop music I was always keeping an ear on experimental things I always at the experimental side of pop music, and I started in high school to invent musical build musical instruments because I wanted things that I couldn't afford to buy or my parents wouldn't give me for the holidays. So uh, my first instruments were built uh, in my garage at home when I was in 11th grade. And I loved it so much that in 12th grade, I dropped out of advanced placement math and took woodshop, where I told the woodshop teacher that I was going to build instruments. And he said, I don't know anything about it, but I'm happy to, to, you know, to, to let you do whatever. And so I did a year of that. And it always stayed with me. And then I was introduced by my mother, believe it or not, to Harry Parch. And Harry Parch is a very, very important American composer who invented his own orchestra. And she gave me a copy of his book in the, around 1970 called A Genesis of a Music. There it is. <laughs> I've read it three times since then. I'm and, using it to hold up my computer. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like that, I think. And uh, so I started to build more experimental instruments really inspired by Parch. My original instruments were, in, were inspired by sort of psychedelic versions of guitars and sitars and things like that. But then with Parch, I realized that there, I got exposed to a completely uh, different approach to, to uh, inventing. And I started doing that uh, in, the in the early 1970s and started to build gamelans as well. I met Lou Harrison uh, and became very interested in Indonesian music and, uh, and started, is there another book there you have of Lou's? <laughs> And, and so Lou and I collaborated on a number of things in the 1970s and remained friends until his passing. Uh, and, uh, and so my, my inventing took a few, variety of different uh, trajectories. Uh, obviously in the 70s, it was towards world music instruments. Uh, and then at the end of the 70s, I turned towards electronics and built a lot of electronic uh, devices to, that I used to create sound and compositions. And then in the late 90s, I got a commission to, and then I had a sort of a detour into opera, contemporary experimental opera and music theater as a composer. And, uh, and then I got a commission from a new music group that wanted, a music, wanted me to create a music theater piece for them. And I said, well, 
musicians usually make terrible performers if they're not on their instruments. So I need to make this piece about a theater piece about making music. And I said, I will invent a set of instruments for you that will that you that will perform this work on and that will be comprise the set. And that was a piece called Soundstage. And I and I started to invent a large variety of 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 very large scale instruments that were almost somewhere between uh, physical objects like a regular instrument, but also things that are almost sculptural or architectural in scale. And out of that came one of those instruments was an instrument that I will be performing on at the Mandavi Center called the quadrichord. In fact, Soundstage was performed uh, at, I believe it was at the one of the very first seasons at, in Jackson Hall at the Mandavi mm -hmm. Center. Uh, we did Soundstage there. And I remember when we needed to get some hardware and stuff, they would literally open the boxes. They had never been used before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the clamps, the lighting instruments, the things like that were brand new. And the hall was, it was and I'm sure it still is, absolutely gorgeous. That would have um, been 20 years ago now. Next yes. year is our 20th anniversary, believe it or not. Well, that piece premiered in 20, 20, in, in, in 2001. And then it, and then it um, uh, toured for several seasons after. And I believe uh, that was, I think, the second work that we brought to, to UC Davis. In fact, we performed once or there earlier a piece called Raven's Head, a chamber opera. Uh, that, that was before the Mandavi Center mm. had actually opened. Um, and then, and that, and, out, and that is really the trajectory that I'm on right now with my invention. It's a combination of, uh, of large scale instruments that, that use physical phenomena of, of objects, vibe, you know, physical objects in space, but it's oftentimes then controlled through electronic media or that have a real, or more like sculptural. They're sculptural, they're large scale, or they play themselves. You take some energy that the performer or the audience member puts into it, and then an interesting physical phenomena uh, that results in both a visual and a sonic result happens. Now, in the concert that we're doing uh, at the Mandavi Center, we're going to focus on two instruments. One, the quadrichord, which I, actually three instruments, but I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the quadrichord, which was invented first for soundstage. And then in 2006, a wonderful musician named Stephen Schick saw a video of soundstage and he came to me and said, would you make a music theater piece for me where everything was an invented instrument? I don't wanna have anything on there that I already know how to play. And, and, I, and, and I was aware of Steve because he'd been a member of the Bang on a Can All-Stars. I'd seen him play uh, live in that group. And I knew that, and then I, he showed me some videos of him doing other things and I realized here was a collaborator who was game to try anything and do anything. And so I, uh, got pulled together my collaborating team, a, an instrument inventor named Daniel Schmidt, who, we, who I regularly build with, and my longtime colleague and close collaborator, Rindy Eckert, who would write the text and direct the show. And we started to collaborate with Steve. And in 2009, we premiered Chick Machine, which also came to the Mandavi Center mm -hmm. in the fall of 2009. Uh, and uh, am I missing a decade here? No, I think that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for that, uh, piece, I invented another instrument called the Hurdy Grande, which is a very uh, large version using the physical phenomena of the acoustic instrument, the European medieval folk instrument called the Hurdy Gurdy, which mechanically bows strings by hand cranked wheel. And so we put a motor on that wheel and that instrument became my passion and still remains my passion. And so that instrument, which is about 10 feet long, the quadrichord is about uh, 15 feet long. And the, and the Hurdy Grande will be the two featured instruments that I invented in this concert. And then my main collaborator for this concert is a percussionist named Joel Devell. And Joel worked for many years with the electronic instrument pioneer named Don Buchla, who is a very, very uh, important uh, pioneer and one of the founders of, of electronic modular synthesis electronics. And Don in his last few years became more interested in controllers than he was in actual generating sounds through electronic modules. He wanted sounds to be controlled in ways that were different from a keyboard. And so one of his inventions is a thing that Joel collaborated on called the marimba lumina. And that is essentially, it looks like a, uh, like a electronic marimba. It has keys laid out that are struck with mallets on a surface that is an electronic control surface. And so he will be performing on the marimba lumina 
but he's often playing sounds that are my sounds, samples of my sounds, or we even run my sound through his controllers and he manipulates my sound. So there's a lot of cross-pollination between my essentially acoustic, amplified acoustic instruments and his purely electronic instruments. And so Joel and I first started working together in the late 1990s. Um, I had him, he was substituted as a percussionist in my large ensemble, the electroacoustic band. And then he, uh, and then eventually he became the core principal percussionist in that group. And I quickly realized that he was again, one of those kind of collaborative spirits that we could try to do anything together and that his input would be a very essential part of the creative process. And so nowadays when, when we premiere a piece, I will say the composition is by Paul Drescher with Joel DeVell because it's really impossible to take to extract my role as the composer from his role as a really important contributor to the work that you're going to hear on stage. Great, thank you so much. It's it's really um, great to see how uh, the role that the Montgomery Center has played in your career over the years. We're really uh, glad to have been able to uh, host you for those things, as well as the sound maze, which is the last. A wonderful thing that you brought, which was more of a, 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 a opportunity for uh, people to try their hand at your instruments, and that was uh, su students loved that, young kids loved it. It was, it was really a lot of fun. Well, you know that came out of uh, that that sound maze came directly out of the, an experience that happened both with sound with uh, sound stage and with Schick machine. At the end, well, the very first performance we did of, of, uh, of Soundstage was in Minneapolis because it was commissioned by the Walker Art Center. And, and, at the, and it was done in a theater that was kind of a dance studio. So the seating was on bleachers and then the, the performance was on the dance deck. And so the audience had to enter by walking on the, on the stage deck and then go up to their seats. And when they left, they had to walk down. So they were basically on the stage level. So there wasn't the traditional proscenium It'll be more like it is in the, at the you know at at, at the studio theater, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very much like the studio theater. So what happened was at the end of the show, the audience came down and they just were desperate to see the instruments and and to experience them. So we, I said, well, sure, go on. They're they're not like you know Stradivarius. They're they're pretty robust. Uh, you know, a lot of them are very big physical objects. So we let the audience on stage and then we sort of let them play them. And that became a really important part of every performance was at the end of the show, the audience is invited on stage. And after doing that with both Soundstage and with Schick Machine, I said, there was so much energy on the stage at the end of the show with the audience's <laughs> curiosity, let's forget about the show. Let's just make them available to an audience as an installation, as an interactive hands-on uh, experience. And so that was when we first uh, started doing uh, Sound Maze, which continues the tour. It's still... It was actually in San Antonio when, when the when the uh, pandemic hit, and it's actually in storage in San Antonio right now, oh. like heading to New York, probably to New York, um, you know, in the fall. Great. So that that hands-on interactive thing will happen after our show too, where the audience will be invited on stage, to will be there to ask questions and to and people can play the instruments. That's great. I think after watching you, there's probably a built-up desire to try it and to ask a lot of questions so yeah uh, people don't yeah. always understand how did you possibly get that sound and so we try to show them how the playing technique and the physics of the instruments and why that that sound got you how how that sound was created great well so let me turn to henry and shirley your course embodies what a shape course should be and shape uh, stands for science, humanities, and arts process and engagement. Who take someone from a uh, professor from physics and music, and share your knowledge with uh, a group of students. And uh, I'm wondering. Um, oh, I I I think if I'm right, you guys met at one of our matchmaking sessions. You didn't already know each other. You met because you were both interested in the idea of teaching a shape course. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah. We had yeah. we had it was like a dating site. They we put our interests <laughs> up on a chalkboard or something and and right. Shirley and I wound up in the same part of the room. <laughs> well, that's great. And then your proposal grew out of that. 
And so I'm wondering how has it been to teach together and teach the course and, um, you know, with maybe some of the less time hands on because of uh, uh, the pandemic, but I, I did join uh, the Zoom of uh, Paul with the students and uh, there was engagement, there was definitely interest and engagement. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm wondering if you could tell us about the go goals of the course. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll jump in and surely you can you can interrupt me whenever, but uh, I think Shirley and I are kind of like mirror images of each other in some ways. I've long been involved as a you know a musician in both a practical way and as a, in as a as a professor, as a scholar and a researcher. Um, but I've and I've always been fascinated by the problems of tuning, which is uh, one of the things that the physics of music, provides a lot of insight into. Um, and Shirley, on the other hand, is a, is a physicist, not really focusing on sound per se, but knowing a lot about it. And so when I find ourselves in a room and the students have questions, um, she knows instantly answers that I, I have no idea the, the, the answers to. And then I know some things that she seems to be puzzled by. It's like she's been a practical musician all of her life, but has never really had to sit down and grapple with certain kinds of theoretical or cultural questions about music. And so um, I'm learning, I hope, I, I hope the students are learning as much as I am in this process, because I'm learning so much from watching Shirley's demonstrations and her approach to answering the students' questions. Yes, I agree. It's been a, a great partnership to teach this course together. Um, I had taught for many years a freshman seminar relating to physics of waves, and I would talk about musical instruments, and I would then connect it to my research, which has to do with doing images of atoms on surfaces, which also involves waves. Um, and in that course, I had always had the students try to build a musical instrument as the final project to give them something specific to do. And that kind of catalyzed Henry's interest, I guess. And, and we decided to try to add that specifically to this course. But in this course, it's different because we're really giving them more time and better materials in order to build their instruments. So I'm expecting much more interesting instruments to come out of this course than the students have previously done in their parents garage or something like that. Um, another thing about you yeah, asked about the pandemic in the first few weeks of this course, which were remote, turned out not to be so bad because I was able to do some really big demonstrations that we normally can't take to one of the smaller classrooms. And so I, I had the, the lecture hall next to our lecture prep area was not being used. And I could push, I, I had the lecture prep guy help me, you know, set up a lot of big demonstrations that we typically can't take to the smaller classroom. So that worked out okay, I thought, as uh, being able to show the students some things that we usually can't do, though it would have been better to have them in the room to see these <laughs> things, right? But considering the situation, it was not so bad overall, I thought. We, we had planned the class that it would be sort of more lecture demonstration oriented up front, and then the students would be doing more hands-on things at the end. So the timing was okay of, of being sequestered, uh, not being allowed to meet in person. And then our first actual meeting in person was when we visited Paul's yeah. studio in Oakland. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of fun. It was the first time we'd seen students since, <laughs> or I'd seen them since last December. And and it was kind of fun to have lunch with them and hang out at Paul's studio. Um, I should mention that I was really uh, flummoxed and excited when Shirley mentioned this idea of building musical instruments, because that never occurred to me as <laughs> would be part of a music and physics class, but it's just perfect. And then it also made it easier to figure out how to involve the Mandavi Center programming, because I've been aware of Paul Drescher's work for, um, well, for more decades than I care to admit. And I've, you know, he's sort of on the periphery of a number of circles that I travel in. The instrument builder, Dan Schmidt, is a friend of mine as well as a friend of Paul's. And so it seemed natural. So I mentioned that name to the Mandavi Center and they said, oh, Paul's been here, you know, many times, that's perfect. 
So I think, I mean, it all seemed to fall into place really, really well. Yeah, that's great. So when you guys came back from the field trip to Paul's studio, you each wrote me and said, that was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I wanted to know, you know, a little bit more about what made it fun. I was wondering if it was fun, like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory kind of fun. <laughs> So what can you tell me since I wasn't <laughs> along for that? <laughs> I was particularly impressed by Paul's big instruments. Mm -hmm. And he's got marked on them, you know, numbers of harmonics, which is exactly what I was talking about, but with much smaller demonstrations of waves. And he actually uses that when he plays his instruments. So I was really impressed by that connection between the physics of how the thing works and how he actually uses it in a performance. I'd never heard of a performer who even understood that kind of thing <laughs> about an instrument because that's not you know, conventional with normal instruments that you buy or, or play. People don't think about those things. you know. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Well, that intersects the, with, with Henry's interest in tuning, of course, mm -hmm. because that's where I assume your interest in tuning is related to the harmonic series as well. Right. It's related to the harmonic series and also yeah. when tuning isn't related to the harmonic series. Right. I find that fascinating as yes. well. Yeah. Um, and you should know, Paul, that several of the students are determined to make uh, just intonation, this kind of musical intonation that derives from uh, the physical harmonics of strings. They're, they're determined to make that a part of their projects. They Great. were inspired by your, um, I think, just being able to see it, as Shirley said, in some kind of visually comprehensible form really makes the whole mystery of just intonation become a little clearer or a little more graspable anyway. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to have the students there. And I, I felt like they were a very, you know, engaged and attentive and curious. I think they were mystified at times, uh, <laughs> you know, that because it's a little, it is something, what, what, what Joel and I did is we played excerpts of some of our repertory. So we played sort of sections that would demonstrate each instrument and some salient techniques that, that are used to produce sound. And, and then of course, they were also invited to play them themselves and to see them. And that's when they could see that there was the numbering on both instruments. There was, there's the harmonic series laid out very clearly as a guide for me where to get, where to get certain pitches, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, uh, and so and then they visited the shop, which I was a little uh, afraid to, share because it's a just a complete mess it's just uh, i mean people who build things know that shops generally are messy places but ours is particularly messy <laughs> is it messier um because you were you in it more during the pandemic or is it just how it always is uh it's so it, the, the shop gets reconfigured and it's actually at the i was just getting started i've actually been in the shop the last week quite a bit uh, i don't know if i remember i showed you those antenna springs that we're mm -hmm. going to try, and it looks like they're working. Oh, uh, great. I had to order a mess more yesterday. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, so my goal is to, when I start, when I have an idea that I want to explore, is to be able to build and test that idea with materials on hand before I have to go to, uh, to a store or go online to buy things to, 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 I start shopping after I've, the idea is I, I go shopping after I've rough tested and prototyped an idea, and then I can see, okay, it works or it doesn't work. And if it does work or it needs improvement, what, what are the materials that I'll need to sort of refine this idea? So that's why there's just a, a, a ton, I mean, literally, I'm sure more than a ton of materials of all sorts, metals and woods in all kinds of shapes and sizes all over, uh, uh, stored all over the walls and the size and, the, and things like that. And actually, I do have shelves, but they're buried behind other things. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I so think well, all the recycling that goes on in your studio is, yeah. is inspirational. And I think the students um, who are not from the Oakland, Berkeley area and find that not, don't necessarily think of recycling all the time. Um, although they are from Davis. Anyway, I think they found that inspiring. It's like, oh, all of these materials can be repurposed for, yeah. for aesthetic uh, purposes. Yeah, most of them are things that were thrown away by some other manufacturing or industrial process. And, uh, you know, it, it might be wood from a wood shop. It's really just not of a proportion that they'll find useful 
or just things that we find in dumpsters and things like that. And, uh, and we save them and they go, and like yesterday, I, I worked for the last week without having to shop. I went online last night after testing these ideas and now I've, I'm going to be getting new materials to, do, to refine these ideas. So interesting. I'm really uh, looking forward to see to the performance. And um, I think I can, I personally can think about it in a different way now that I've heard you talk about your process of bringing the instruments to life. Um, so before we conclude, Shirley or Paul, uh, sorry, or Henry, do you have, do you have a question for Paul that you'd like to ask? I'd just like to say, I, I was also fascinated by that Hurley Grand instrument mm -hmm. because of the way it operates. You know, the this rotating wheel with the rosin that causes the sound of the strings to sound at all and how you go about playing it. I thought that was really fascinating and very unusual, of course, as a method for either building an instrument or I don't know how you came up with that, Paul. I, it just starts with, a, I, I had, you know, I, I was aware of a hurdy-gurdy. Uh, uh -huh. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the hurdy-gurdy, uh, but really. it's a it's this European folk instrument. Uh, it's uh, it's been around. It, it exists in almost every European culture. Some mm -hmm. version of it, uh, from Eastern Europe all the way into you know into England and Ireland. Um, it's you see it in paintings from uh, Bruegel's and Hieronymus Bosch are paintings mm -hmm. of of that. And there's and a I famous didn't... Donovan song as well. Yeah, that's how I know of it. Right. <laughs> right. But there's no hurdy gurdy in the song, actually. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and and people confuse the hurdy gurdy with the organ grinder, because mm -hmm. the organ grinder is also turning a crank, to mm -hmm. to pump air, mm -hmm. and so uh, so people often think of a they people there's a lot of cultural confusion around the I you know the organ grinder with the monkey who takes the coins from you and <laughs> And the uh, and the hurdy gurdy, um, but the hurdy gurdy and I was just curious. So this is the only instrument in the world that I know of that mechanically bows strings. So I said, what could be done? Is there something else that could be done with that? That 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 I just have never done. I've never played it. I've never experimented with it. So that was just surely it was just that question. I was also fascinated by the mechanics of it, and mm -hmm. then uh, and then I had to find. So then we had to start experimenting with how to how do you bow a string uh, mm -hmm. with a wheel. You know, mechanically, mm -hmm. and then it turned out that it, I had multiple epiphanies about the playing technique and the music that was possible, and that led to the instrument taking the shape that it actually has now. Yeah. And there I'm glad you asked that, Shirley, because I I was <laughs> fascinated by that instrument as well. And the students, a lot of the solutions that you described to particular problems, I think, really stuck with them. I've heard a couple of them talking about muting parts of the string so that the other part of the string can sound and various other techniques that you explained so clearly to them. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. good. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, playing music is play and playing around in the shop is play for me also, you know, and just imagining and, and solving problems. That is the fun. It's, uh, you know, a problem is not a problem in a sense. It's, it's a, a problem is a, a curiosity challenge. And a puzzle. Yeah. And it's really fun to solve them. Particularly when you get a musical instrument out at the at the end, something that I can you can use in multiple creative ways. So I can tell that um, the audience is going to have fun watching the results of your uh, fun experiments leading up to these instruments, and so I uh, I personally can't wait till March 11th and 12th to be able to uh, see the end results. And just want to thank you, Paul and Shirley and Henry, for taking some time with me today to talk about the the performance and the class. And um, I'm so happy that it has all worked out the way it has. It's, it's what uh, the concept of shape was about, and it's great when it comes to life, uh, maybe even better than we all thought it would. So <laughs> let me thank you all one more time, and we'll see you at the Mondavi Center. And I want to thank the Mondavi Center and Henry and Shirley for the support for this project, and for the Mondavi Center for over 20 years of support. It's been mm -hmm. really, really important to us uh, for our creative process and to bring it to audiences again and again, and it's such a wonderful venue. Well, on behalf of the Mondavi Center, I'll say you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Paul. Shirley, thanks. Thank you. Okay. And I'll see you Bye. on the Zoom in about a, about a little less than two weeks, it looks like. Right? Okay. And see okay. you at the Mondavi Center. Great. All right. Bye-bye. Okay.